This week we began a three-part sermon series on a sacred trust, how the past, present, and future of the church are woven together in the power of God's Spirit and in the mystery of God's being. So here are these words of Paul from his letter to the Ephesians, a letter in which he talks about what it means to be the church, the body of Christ in the world, and how in Christ God has broken down the walls of hostility that once separated the Jewish people from the Gentiles, from all of us. Listen now to God's word from Ephesians 2, beginning at the 11th verse. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that at one time without Christ, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. And I reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> In William Faulkner's novel, Requiem for a Nun, we hear the well-known phrase, the past is never dead, it's not even past. We carry the past with us at all times as a present memory. The past shapes us, it shapes the people around us, the communities in which we live, and even our environment. The path both limits the choices we make and at the same time, creates new possibilities for our lives. A pure scientific behaviorist might say that the past actually determines every choice we make and there is no freedom to act. But I prefer to believe that the past sets the context in which God gives us the freedom through the Holy Spirit to make our choices about how to live and how to act. After the death of Moses, a great moment of transition for the people of Israel. God raises up Joshua to lead the children of Israel from the wilderness into the promised land. It has been a long 40 years in the desert, a kind of a shakedown cruise on dry land. The people are ready to leave their tents and to leave that, that daily diet of quail and manna, to leave their tents for established homes and to be able to eat the harvest of the fields, the fruit of the trees, and the vineyard's produce. They bring into that promised land all of their past history, all that they have learned from God and from their experiences. And the Lord wants them to remember some things as they enter the promised land, to remember the divine promise that he made to Moses and to Abraham that they would inherit this land. And the Lord wants to remind them when they enter the promised land to keep the law that had been given to Moses. And the Lord says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail or forsake you. And it is these memories that they carry, these precious memories they carry with them 
And all of these memories are the very things that make them strong and courageous as they enter the land. You see, it is not only that they carry the past with them, but the past carries them. In a similar way, Paul, speaking to the church in those early days in Ephesus, he speaks of what God has done for them in Jesus Christ. and the cross of Christ, God has abolished, put to death the distinction between Jews and Gentiles. He has abolished the hostility and the separation and created one new person where there had been two. In Christ, God has taken those who did not know God, who lived estranged from God, and grafted them in to the covenant people. God has made those who were once aliens and strangers, both members of the household of faith and citizens of a heavenly kingdom. Now, when Paul says that G Jesus has abolished the law and its commandments, he does not mean that once we are grafted into Christ, once we become one new people, we can do whatever feels good, we can do whatever we like. No, he doesn't mean that. But he means that obedience to the law, obedience to the commandment, is no longer the foundation. It is no longer the foundation that makes us the people of God. Christ is the foundation. And God has reconciled us to one another in Jesus Christ. And as God's own family, we keep the commandments. We honor the law, not out of fear, not out of trying to achieve something for ourselves, not out of slavish obedience, but out of joy and gratitude and thankfulness. Paul wants the church tossed about like so much salad in the Roman world to remember who they are. Paul wants us to know that we are the body of Christ, not because we have earned it, not because we deserve it, not because we have achieved it. We are the body of Christ because God in Christ has put to death once and for all our sin and alienation. And how we live today is determined by this past, this great, wonderful, merciful act of God. How we live together as the body of Christ when we live upon the foundation of Christ means that we live not with a sense of privilege, but with a heart of humility. Not with an air of superiority, but with a desire to serve others. We live not with a spirit of rancor and discord, but with a spirit of unity and peace. We are no longer strangers and aliens, but we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And it is this past, this spiritual heritage, that carries us forward. This is our 175th anniversary year, as you have been hearing and heard today in our video presentation. So what do you do with an anniversary? You know, there are always those who would just ignore the past and say it really doesn't matter. I know all about that because I'm a child of the 60s. I thought everything was a new day. You know, I'm free to do what I want to do, be whatever I want to be. Ha. Ha. All that matters, some people think, is the here and the now. But such an attitude as those is similar to those who just forget an anniversary. Think about it. Forget your anniversary before long, you lose the memory of that first date. You forget what you did on your honeymoon. You forget the struggles and the joys of the first year of marriage. You forget that very first time after the children came when you were finally free. Ah, just to go out, the two of you together. Anniversaries help you remember all these things and more. They help make present who you are as a couple and why you are as a couple. They bring to the present your common experiences and the love that you share. When we just simply ignore the past, we do not learn, we do not grow from our experiences. We do not re renew the bonds that unite us. We do not remember our common purpose. We lose our moorings. We fall adrift. We lose our perspective and our capacity to make good decisions in the present 
based upon our experiences in the past. So some people just ignore it. There are other people that romanticize the past. They're always looking back to that golden time when things were better. And so they spend their energy, their time, their efforts trying to reestablish some glory days. However, in most cases, memory's very selective and such glory days really didn't exist. Things weren't always so glorious or grand as we like to think. I've told some of you about an elder who was on the session in one of the churches we served when we first got out of seminary. It was right before my first session meeting, and he came up to me and he says, Young man, yes, sir. I haven't had one new idea in 40 years. And just because you're our new pastor, don't think I'm starting now. <laughs> it's been said that tradition can be the living faith of the dead or the dead faith of the living. But when we romanticize the past and always trying to return to it, calcified traditions can stifle the power of a living faith in the present. So what do we do with this anniversary? What do we do with our past? To have the right perspective on the past means that we need to be willing to learn from the past as it pushes us, compels us forward. And so we heard today what God has done. We heard today in the scriptures that we serve a God who is with us in the Holy Spirit just as God was with the children of Israel and that great turning point in their life together as they entered the promised land. As we face the challenges of each day, we are not alone. We're sustained by the Spirit. And we learn that our individual lives and our life together, says Paul, are built upon what? the foundation of grace, God's unmerited favor. And when grace is the sole foundation of our lives, then we extend that grace to one another within the church, and even that grace to those beyond the church who do not yet know the love of God in Christ. For it is only grace that has the power to eliminate petty squabbles and transform judgmental minds and open closed hearts. We learn to be strong and to have courage like the children of Israel and like those first Christians in the city of Ephesus who were like strangers in a strange land. It takes just as much courage and strength to be a Christian today to put God first in our lives amid all the completing, competing claims for our time and our loyalty, our love and our attention and our resources. Some of you may have heard of Dr. Charles Kramer. He was a former moderator of the Presbyterian Church, and he served at one point as the president of the Presbyterian School of Christian Education in Richmond. But after the Second World War, he served as the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, which was my wife's home church. It was after the Second World War and GIs were returning home. They were getting married, finishing schools, starting careers, having children, and moving to the suburbs. In Charlotte, that great old lady church, First Church, sat down almost at the square. They were not coming back to the church. They were going and staying in the suburbs. Dr. Kramer pondered, what do we do? What do we do? We have this great heritage. What do we do? So he decided to send a postcard to all the members of the church and said, next Sunday we're going to have a congregational meeting to decide to move the church to the suburbs. Needless to say, that once half-empty church was packed to the rafters. Everyone came. What? How dare he think of such a thing? Move the church? Impossible. Over my dead body. So the thoughts ran. And then when Dr. Kramer got up to speak, there was no meeting, of course. He simply said, it's good to see all of you here today. <laughs> he said, now that we've had the funeral... It's time for the resurrection. 
And what a resurrection it was. That church, with its rich history of faithfulness, recommitted itself to vibrant worship in the center and the heart of the city. It began new vital outreach ministries that continue to this day. It built upon the past and its traditions of faith and service. When we learn from the past of our own congregation, we gain rich resources for facing the present challenges of this time. For our past pushes us into a deeper faithfulness, a bolder witness, a greater love. Founded as a new school Presbyterian church in 1938, I mean 1838, oh, what's 100 years? Founded as a new school Presbyterian church in 1838, we have always been evangelistic in our outlook, committed to reformed worship enhanced by music and art, ecumenically minded in our work with other congregations and traditions, always focused on educating children and adults, and bold in our efforts to witness and to serve Christ in the community and world. And so much of what we do this very day is rooted in what this congregation has been led by the Spirit to do in decades past. But we simply do not repeat the past, no. But from the past, we learn how to meet the challenges of the day with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We heard in our video about Westminster Neighborhood Ministries. Our ministries in the Westminster community and here in the north side are grounded in this congregation's long-time commitment to social, spiritual, and educational ministry as exemplified by Meyer Chapel. Did you know that Second Presbyterian Church was the first congregation in this city to establish a choir? It was led by Charles Beecher, the brother of Henry Ward Beecher, who was said to be, by many of the ladies of the congregation, quite the gentleman. Our current vital and diverse ministries of music and art grow out of this heritage. And all of our children and youth ministries today flow from the vision of one pastor and one church leader. That is the Reverend Hanford Edson, who came to this church in the midst of the Civil War, a time in which this church was losing membership and struggling. And he had a vision for creating a children's Sunday school, a Sabbath school, he was also the man who helped establish the public library system in Indianapolis. And in his desire to establish a Sunday school, he recruited Miss Eleanor Kirby to become the head of the primary department. She was a professional teacher here in our city. She organized and trained countless volunteers, and she served in that ministry for more than 55 years. You think it's gone? Oh no. It's still here. Inspiring new generations to leadership. And I could speak of others and I could say more, but let me simply say this about Miss Eleanor Kirby. And point to her as one of the great heroes of the past from whom we can learn. And when you leave worship today, I hope you'll go down this aisle. And I hope you'll go down this corridor and see her portrait there hanging across from the parlor. And look into her eyes and see what the eyes of faith look like. Passing a love for Jesus Christ from one generation to the next. And when I look at her and hear her story, I feel the push of the past to be faithful to our living God in this time and in this place. One day, somebody's going to tell your story. And I don't know if they'll paint your picture or not, or they may just tell it in words or a few snapshots. But they will tell how you learned from all that you had received, the blessings of your life, 
the experiences of the past and how you built upon this great rich heritage a living faith for this day. Amen.